my brother is gone. I couldn't believe it, that father uh, chose to take him out. I think the whole thing was a fight. He wanted his old man to fight. He saw a way to make the old man suffer. When the doctors examined Marvin Gaye Sr. after the shooting, they diagnosed him with a brain tumor. Brain tumors can cause personality changes such as confusion, anxiety, mood swings, and aggression. I tried to commit suicide um, uh, through an overdose of coke. I was in an emotional state, but I'm pretty depressed most of the time. April 1st is widely recognized as April Fool's Day, a time when people often play pranks and share false news. So when the news broke on April 1st, 1984, that singer Marvin Gaye had been shot dead by his own father, many initially dismissed it as a tasteless joke. The tragic event occurred just one day before what would have been Gay's 45th birthday. While the history of pop music is marked by the untimely deaths of many stars due to died, overdose, and accidents, the idea that an artist could be K'd by their own father was beyond belief. Singer Marvin Gaye was shot and killed Sunday in Los Angeles reportedly during a family argument. Adding to the sense of disbelief was the seemingly trivial motive behind the tragedy, an argument between Marvin Gaye's parents over insurance papers in their Los Angeles home. Under the influence of and and PCP, Gaye physically attacked his father. In response, his father used a revolver that Marvin had given him months earlier, shooting his son twice. The first bullet, which went straight through his heart, was fatal. A jury later exonerated Marvin Gaye Sr. on the grounds of self-defense. The nature of the tumor and the location of the tumor causes uh, Father Gaye to go in and out, and by that we mean that on any one given day he can appear competent, and on another given day he can appear incompetent. Following the incident, his wife, Alberta Cooper, immediately filed for divorce. Marvin Gaye Sr. died of pneumonia in a nursing home in 1998 at the age of 84. For those familiar with Marvin Gaye's tumultuous career and personal struggles, the tragic end, while shocking, was not entirely unexpected. Marvin Gaye's charisma and his body of work, characterized by humanism and a range of love songs from the deeply spiritual to the sensuously explicit. stood in stark contrast to his tormented life. His life was heavily burdened by his turbulent relationship with his father, the very man who eventually took his life. You know why you didn't make it one thing? <laughs> Remember you used to ask us to pray for you? That's one time I didn't pray for you. <laughs> I won't tell you why, because I didn't want them to break you up. Marvin Gaye Sr. was a preacher in the House of God, a conservative Christian congregation that combined elements of Pentecostalism and Orthodox Judaism, enforcing strict codes of conduct. Despite this, he was lenient on himself. Family members recalled him as an alcoholic with a propensity for extramarital affairs. Gay's childhood and adolescence were marred by his father's cruelty and domestic violence, contributing to the singer's lifelong struggles. This explains Marvin's permanent obsession with S, which he carried with a great sense of guilt, explains music critic Louis Lapuente. It has been suggested that the young Marvin changed his original surname due to relentless bullying from other children, who frequently subjected him to homophobic insults. Another, more romanticized story claims he adopted Gay to emulate his idol Sam Cooke, who had also altered his surname. In her memoir, My Brother Marvin, Gay's sister Zayola recounts that their father used to wear women's clothes at home, an experience that tormented and traumatized the singer. Even amidst his peak of success, Marvin Gaye seldom found solace in his fame, and grappled with numerous contradictions. While he was a prominent advocate for social justice, he found himself in self-imposed exile in London and Ostend, Belgium, during the early 1980s due to his conflicts with the US tax authorities. During this period, he struggled with compulsive consumption of pornography, addiction, thoughts, and a paranoid disposition that led him to believe in a conspiracy to assassinate him. Consequently, he often wore bulletproof vests as a precaution. Ironically, it was this paranoia that led him to gift his father the 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver that was ultimately used to end his life, rather than for his own protection. He wanted his old man to He saw a way to make the old man suffer. 
but where did it all start? On April 2nd, Marvin Pence Gay Jr. was born to Alberta and Marvin Pence Gay in Washington, D.C. at Friedman's Hospital. Marvin grew up with his parents, older sister Jeannie, younger brother Frankie, and younger sister Zayola in a segregated, impoverished urban area of southwest D.C. The Gays maintained a strict religious household where many pleasures such as television, movies, and dancing were banned. Marvin's father, a minister, used both physical and psychological punishment to discipline his children, especially Marvin, who provoked his father in order to get whatever attention he could. Marvin's mother supported the family through teaching and domestic work. Marvin loved his mother so much because she was there to defend him and to encourage him and just about everything. She told me he would be a great star one day. Marvin accompanied his father to church services and began singing, performing, and playing instruments as early as three years old. Marvin became a member of the DC Tones doo-wop group. In October, he dropped out of high school and enlisted in the Air Force. The following June, Marvin was discharged from the Air Force and returned to DC, where he joined another doo-wop group, the Marquis. It was during this time that Marvin crossed paths with Harvey Fuqua. The Marquis eventually merged with Fuqua's group, the Moonglows. Seeking to refine his skills, Marvin relocated to Chicago immersing himself in the professional and technical aspects of music. However, his time on the road with fellow musicians also introduced him to experimentation with drugs. In the same year, Marvin showcased his vocal talent by singing lead on Mama Lucy, his first recording as a lead vocalist. Fuqua, recognizing Marvin's talent, relocates with him to Detroit and secures a deal for him with Gwen Gordy's label, Anna Label, a subsidiary of Motown. Despite his signing, Marvin's role initially revolves around drumming and piano sessions for Anna Label's other artists, notably contributing to the Marvelettes hit record, Please Mr. Postman. Concurrently, Marvin begins to court Anna Gordy. In December, he encounters Barry Gordy at a Christmas party and inks a deal with Tomla. He came over and he said, um, I think I, 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 if I can recall, he said something to the effect that um, I, I like that melody. Marvin takes a significant step by legally changing his name to Gay, appending the final E partly to distinguish himself from his father's name, quell rumors about his S, and emulate his idol Sam Cooke. By May, Marvin releases his debut single on Tomla, featuring Let Your Conscience Be Your Guide on the A side and Never Let You Go, Shalu Bop on the B side. Something about unable to adjust to regimentation and authority and good riddance or something, I don't know. The following month marks the release of his inaugural album, The Soulful Moods of Marvin Gaye on Tamla. In October, Marvin joins the first Motown Review for a two-month US tour, where he shares the stage with his peers. Despite receiving minimal guidance from Motown's artistic director, Marvin notably heeds advice against performing with closed eyes. By December, Stubborn Kinda Fellow, a track reflecting Marvin's personality, hits the airwaves, climbing to number 8 on the R&B charts and number 46 on the pop charts. Tracks like Hitchhike and Pride and Joy further solidify Marvin's early commercial success. In a banner year, Marvin achieves remarkable success with four hits, two of which are collaborations with Tammy Terrell, soaring into the top 10 charts in the US. One of these hits, I Heard It Through the Grapevine, marks Marvin's first number one pop single, selling nearly 4 million copies and reigning atop the charts for seven consecutive weeks. In January, the single What's Going On hits the airwaves and swiftly becomes Motown's fastest selling recording. By March, Marvin embarks on recording the seminal album, What's Going On? Upon its release in May, the album enjoys immediate success, selling half a million copies on its first day and claiming the number six spot on the US charts. What's going on? Yeah. Time magazine later hails it as one of the top 10 albums of the year. Marvin's artistic prowess earns him accolades from the NAACP and record world, solidifying his reputation as a serious musician. He leverages his newfound influence to advocate for artistic freedoms for recording artists. However, Marvin's success is tempered by personal struggles. His tour is marred by physical exhaustion and Okay. Paranoia strains his relationship with Janice, prompting her to relocate their children to her mother's home while Marvin seeks refuge with his mother. Despite his efforts to escape his troubles, Motown rejects his new album, Love Man, prompting Marvin to retreat to Hawaii in a bid to distance himself from his problems. He wanted to do the impossible, and uh, that was part of the reason for his, his whole 
feeling of being divided amongst himself. But in all these successful years, Gay's relationship with his father remained strained to the extent that his father became responsible for his son's death. The tumultuous bond between the singer and his cross-dressing minister father Marvin Sr. ended tragically. Marvin Sr., known for his frequent beatings, starvation of his children, and A towards his wife, represented the dark side of their relationship. Despite this, Marvin Gaye, the Motown legend, was hailed for soothing the masses with his heavenly voice and divine artistry, as noted by music critic Michael Eric Dyson. However, behind the soothing melodies lay a man burdened with immense pain. Marvin Gaye's anguish stemmed primarily from his tumultuous relationship with his father, Marvin Gaye Sr., a man who openly resented his son's existence and inflicted his rage upon him, particularly in his volatile alcoholic state. Despite enduring a childhood marred by A, Marvin Gaye rose to become a celebrated soul singer under Motown Records during the 1960s and 70s. However, by the 1980s, grappling with addiction and financial woes, he returned to live with his parents in Los Angeles. He wanted everything to be beautiful, a friend once said of Gay. I think his only real happiness was in his music. It was there, in the family's Los Angeles home, that the tension between Gay and his father reached its tragic climax, when Marvin Gay Sr. fatally shot his son three times in the chest on April 1st, 1984. But as the Prince of Motown's brother Frankie later said in his memoir, Marvin Gay, my brother, Marvin Gay's death seemed written in stone from the beginning. Father's off the hook, Marvin's off the hook, yeah. and there's a lot of fighting, arguing. Marvin Pence Gay Jr., he changed the spelling of his surname later on, was born on April 2nd, 1939 in Washington, D.C. From the start, there was violence inside the home thanks to his father, and violence outside the home due to the rough neighborhood and public housing project in which they lived. Gay described living in his father's house as, quote, living with a king, a very peculiar, changeable, cruel, and all-powerful king. That king, Marvin Gay Sr., hailed from Jessamine County, Kentucky, where he was born to an abusive father of his own in 1914. By the time he had a family himself, Gay was a minister in a strict Pentecostal sect, who disciplined his children severely, with Marvin reportedly getting the worst of it. While residing under his father's roof, the young Gay endured relentless A, subjected to vicious beatings nearly every day. His sister Jeannie remembered Gay's childhood as a succession of brutal whippings. Gay himself later disclosed, quote, By the time I was 12, there was not an inch on my body that hadn't been bruised and beaten by him. The relentless A drove Marvin Gay to seek solace in music at an early age, using it as a means of escape. And when you see him, you see his little head up there between the piano and some of the bishops just sit there. And he would sit there during the whole service. That's what he liked to say. He later acknowledged that without his mother's nurturing and support, he might have succumbed to suicide. The A, which triggered these dark contemplations, may have been influenced by Marvin Gaye Sr.'s complex feelings about his rumored HS. While the veracity of these rumors remain uncertain, they were fueled in part by his cross-dressing, a behavior often inaccurately associated with HS, particularly in earlier decades. He was a cross-dresser, and he had uh, pedal pushers on, and uh, nylons, and a uh, woman's blouse with a fedora hat. According to Marvin Gaye, his father often wore women's clothes, and, quote, there have been periods when my father's hair was very long and curled under, and when he seemed quite adamant in showing the world the girlish side of him. Despite the adversity he faced, Marvin Gaye's remarkable music talent flourished. From performing in his father's church at the tender age of four to mastering the piano and drums during his teenage years, Gaye exhibited an extraordinary aptitude for music. His passion for R&B and doo-wop grew deep roots. As he began to establish himself professionally, Gay sought to break free from the shadow of his turbulent relationship with his father. In a symbolic gesture, he changed his surname from Gay to Gay with an E at the end. This move not only marked a step towards independence, but also aimed to quell rumors suggesting both he and his father were HS. Gay's journey led him to Detroit, where he ventured with a musical companion and eventually landed a performance opportunity for Barry Gordy, the iconic founder of Motown Records. Impressed by Gay's talent, Gordy swiftly signed him to the label. Gay's association with Motown not only propelled his career, but also led to his marriage to Gordy's older sister, Anna. However, by the conclusion of his final tour in 1983, Gay found himself battling a addiction, compounded by the strain of his failed marriage to Anna due to his infidelity, which sparked a bitter legal dispute. Struggling with addiction-induced paranoia and financial instability, Gay sought refuge by returning home. The news of his mother's recovery from kidney surgery provided added impetus for him to move back into the family home in Los Angeles. Back home, he found himself in a pattern of violent fights with his father. Even after decades, the old problems between the two were still raging. 
My husband never wanted Marvin and he never liked him. Alberta Gay, Marvin Gaye's mother later explained, he used to say he didn't think he was really his child. I told him that was nonsense. He knew Marvin was his, but for some reason he didn't love Marvin and what's worse, he didn't want me to love Marvin either. Despite reaching adulthood, Marvin Gaye grappled with complex emotions regarding his father's cross-dressing and the rumors surrounding his ass. As recounted by one biographer, Gaye carried a deep-seated fear that his father's S orientation would somehow shape his own. He confessed, quote, I find the situation all the more difficult because I have the same fascination with women's clothes. In my case, that has nothing to do with any attraction for men. Men don't interest me. It's also something I fear. Amidst these fears, Marvin Gaye's struggle with addiction and his father's battle with alcoholism, his return home spiraled into violence. Despite being kicked out by his father, Gay persisted yearning for reconciliation, declaring, quote, I have just one father, I want to make peace with him. Yet fate intervened, denying him that opportunity. The tragic demise of Marvin Gaye unfolded like countless other family conflicts. On April 1st, 1984, tensions erupted into a physical altercation between Marvin Gaye and his father, Marvin Gaye Sr., following yet another heated argument in their Los Angeles residence. Allegedly, Gay began A, his father, until his mother, Alberta, intervened to separate them. As Gay sought solace in conversation with his mother in his bedroom, attempting to defuse the tension, his father retrieved a gift his son had once given him, a 38 special. In a fateful moment, Marvin Gay Sr. entered the bedroom, wordlessly raising the weapon and firing once into his son's chest. That single shot proved fatal, but as Gay collapsed, his father mercilessly fired two more shots at point-blank range, extinguishing the life of his own flesh and blood. Alberta, overwhelmed by horror, fled the scene, leaving her younger son Frankie and his wife, who resided in a guest house on the property, as the first witnesses to encounter the aftermath of Marvin Gaye's tragic death. Recalling the harrowing moment, Frankie described how his mother collapsed before them, lamenting, he shot Marvin, he's Cade, my boy. Marvin Gaye was officially pronounced dead at the age of 44 at 1.01 p.m. Upon the arrival of law enforcement, Marvin Gaye Sr. was found seated calmly on the porch, still holding the firearm. When questioned by the police about his feelings toward his son, Gay replied chillingly, let's say I didn't dislike him. Despite Marvin Gay Sr.'s openly expressed animosity towards his son, there appeared to be a shift in his demeanor following Marvin Gay's tragic demise. He began to make statements expressing sorrow over the loss of his cherished child, and asserted that he was not entirely cognizant of his actions. I mean, there's I wish I could join back. I wish, you know, I just, I just read it. It's, it's killing me. During an interview conducted while he was in jail awaiting trial, Gay confessed, quote, I pulled the trigger, but maintained that he believed the gun contained BB pellets, not live ammunition. This assertion suggests a complex mix of remorse and perhaps a desire to mitigate the severity of his actions. Gay Sr. recounted the fatal moment, stating, quote, The first one didn't seem to bother him. He put his hand up to his face like he'd been hit with a BB, and then I fired again. In his defense, Gay Sr. portrayed his son as having transformed into a beast-like person due to cocaine, alleging that Marvin Gay had viciously attacked him before the shooting. However, subsequent investigations failed to substantiate Gay Sr.'s claims. Lieutenant Robert Martin, the lead detective on the case stated, quote, there was no indication of bruises, nothing like he'd been punched out or that kind of stuff. This lack of physical evidence cast doubt on Gay Sr.'s justification for his actions, painting a tragic picture of a family torn apart by violence in Substance A. Distraught neighbors asserted that the argument preceding Marvin Gaye's death revolved around plans for the singer's upcoming 45th birthday, which was scheduled for the following day. However, subsequent reports suggested that the altercation erupted over an insurance policy letter that Alberta had misplaced, provoking Marvin Gaye's anger. Regardless of the catalyst and the validity of Gaye Sr.'s claims regarding BB pellets, he expressed remorse, indicating that he was unaware of his son's death until informed by a detective hours later. This acknowledgement of remorse underscores the tragedy and complexity of the situation, revealing the profound impact of the family's discord and the irreversible consequences of their confrontation. Quote, I just didn't believe it, he said. I thought he was kidding me. I said, oh, God of mercy, oh, oh, oh. It just shocked me. I just went to pieces, just cold. I just sat there and I didn't know what to do, just sitting there like a mummy. In a surprising turn, the courts appeared to show some leniency towards Marvin Gaye Sr.'s narrative of events, despite the brutal manner of Marvin Gaye's death. On September 20th, 1984, Gay Sr. was permitted to enter a plea bargain of no contest to one count of voluntary manslaughter. Seems to be agreed by everybody that the young man who died, died tragically, provoked this incident. And it was all his fault. He received a suspended six-year sentence along with five years of probation. 
Gay Sr. lived out the remainder of his life in a California nursing home, passing away in 98 at the age of 84. One of Marvin's fans wrote, So sad. Marvin Gaye was by far one of the best soul artists out there. It's always your own people sometimes. Another one added, His father going to be suffering in hell. K your own son, unforgivable. He gave his last words on the death of Marvin Gaye at his sentencing on November 20th, 1984. Quote, If I could bring him back, I would. I was afraid of him. I thought I was going to get hurt. I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm really sorry for everything that happened. I loved him. I wish he could step through this door right now. I'm paying the price now. Marvin Gaye's relationship with the legendary Detroit label Motown experienced both highs and lows. Initially, he began his journey with Motown by combining his work as a session drummer with occasional singles as a vocalist, under the guidance of the assertive Barry Gordy. In 1962, he achieved his first major hit, That Stubborn Kinda Fellow. A significant turning point came when Gay married Anna Gordy, Barry Gordy's sister, in 1963. However, this marriage did not necessarily ease his path within the company. One of the most poignant moments in Gay's life occurred during a performance when his frequent collaborator, singer Tammy Terrell, with whom he recorded several hit duets, including Ain't No Mountain High Enough, collapsed in his arms. Terrell was diagnosed with a brain tumor and tragically passed away in 1970, sending Gay into a profound depression. He even contemplated leaving the music industry to pursue a career in the NFL. Moreover, Gay's artistic evolution with albums like What's Going On caused friction with Barry Gordy. The politically charged nature of the album was seen as risky by Gordy, who feared it could tarnish Gay's image as a soul heartthrob and Motown's reputation as a politically neutral music powerhouse. Despite this, Gay pressed forward with his vision, ultimately creating a masterpiece that challenged societal norms and left an indelible mark on the music industry. Marvin Gaye's marital troubles with Anna Gordy added another layer of complexity to his life. Their separation in 1973 marked the beginning of a tumultuous divorce process that concluded four years later. Quote, When the marriage fell apart, notes La Puente, Marvin recorded yet another of his remarkable LPs, Here My Dear, featuring turbulent songs with autobiographical undertones. As as part of the divorce settlement, all profits from the album were to be entirely allocated to Anna. During this period, Gay also released another iconic album in 1973, Let's Get It On, a landmark work centered around themes of S. This album is credited with inaugurating a subgenre within soul music focused on sensuality, influencing artists like Teddy Pendergrass, Luther Vandross, R. Kelly, and many others. Indeed, these two pivotal albums, What's Going On and Let's Get It On, have had a profound and enduring impact. What's Going On is hailed as one of the first attempts to create a definitive African-American album setting a precedent for future groundbreaking works by artists like Prince, Sign of the Times. Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, Kanye West, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy, Beyonce, Lemonade, Kendrick Lamar to Pimp a Butterfly, D'Angelo, Black Messiah, and Kamasi Washington, The Epic. Their influence reverberates through contemporary music to this day. Marvin Gaye's biography 40 years after his passing unveils a profound American narrative. Within its pages, one can discern compelling parallels shedding light on the trajectory of the music industry and entertainment realm alongside the evolution of soul music itself. It delves into the disturbing and intricate web linking fascination with firearms, S, religion, and domestic violence. Moreover, it navigates the complex interplay between the rise and fall of the hippie utopia, marked by the tragic of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr., the emergence of the Black Panthers, and the relentless fight for civil rights, eventually intersecting with the rise of yuppie culture during the Reagan era. It's quite astonishing that Marvin Gaye's captivating story hasn't yet captured Hollywood's attention despite numerous attempts, particularly in recent years. Back in 2006, the S Healing Project was initiated, boasting an unexpected lineup of producers including James Gandolfini and Jean-Luc Van Damme. The biopic aimed to chronicle the final three years of the singer's life with Jesse L. Martin set to portray Gay, bearing a striking resemblance under the direction of Lauren Goodman. However, the film's journey has been fraught with twists and turns since its inception. In a subsequent endeavor, renowned director Julian Temple was slated to helm the project with Lenny Kravitz initially cast as gay. Kravitz even journeyed to Ostend to immerse himself in Gay's world, yet eventually withdrew from the production. As per IMDb, the film remains in production, with Temple still at the helm and Jesse L. Martin once again poised to depict gay. In 2008, there was speculation that F. Gary Gray, known for directing the NWA biopic Straight Outta Compton, would helm a Marvin Gaye biopic covering the singer's entire life. Simultaneously, Cameron Crowe, the director of Almost Famous, began work on a project titled My Name is Marvin, with the rumor swirling that Will Smith would star. However, Crowe stated in 2011 that the timing was not right for the film. 
Five years later, news surfaced about a series featuring Jamie Foxx as gay. And in 2018, Dr. Dre announced plans to produce yet another film to be directed by Alan Hughes. Despite these efforts, none of these projects have materialized. Rumors suggest that the primary obstacle lies in the reluctance of Gaye's heirs to grant their approval for these endeavors. But whether Marvin Gaye Sr. was indeed truly penitent, or the death of Marvin Gaye was a cold, conscious act, the beloved singer was gone forever. Father and son were never able to escape the cycle of A that lasted the latter's entire life.